Euh, Antonello Frongia est professeur associé à l'université Roma 3 en histoire de l'art. Il est spécialiste de l'histoire de la photographie. Il est dans le comité éditorial de la revue euh, Revista di Studi di Fotografia et euh, il euh, est membre également euh, du comité directeur du musée de la photographie euh, contemporaine de Sinicello Balsamo, si je ne me trompe pas, au niveau de la prononciation. Et euh, bon, donc on a vu un, un spécialiste de Guido Guidi et également de, euh, notamment de la photographie topographique américaine et de Louis Balls. Et il va nous parler euh, de euh, la, de la photographie italienne euh, et de son rapport au temps. Voilà, merci. Okay. Merci. Um, yeah, I'm going to present in English. I apologize. Um, I think I can um, take questions in French, but I will be obliged to respond in, in English. Um, thank you, Marta, for introducing this sort of Italian panel this afternoon. And also, I want to thank right away Daniel Meoe, Jordi Balesta, and everybody involved in the organization of the conference today. And thank you for accepting my proposal and for giving me this challenging opportunity, sorry, uh, to look at landscape photography, in particular, Italian landscape photography of the 1980s and 90s from a new perspective as I will try to argue today rather perversely perhaps, it is mostly from a geographical rather than a temporal perspective than Ital that Italian photography has conceptualized itself over time. To rethink it in terms of um, paysage temps not only adds to our understanding of the cultural and philosophical implications of such photographic practice, but also Uh, as I will try to explain in, my, in the last part of my presentation, allows us to recapture kind of civic values and functions that landscape photographs embody and that I believe have been lost along the way. Um, so I think everybody here is familiar with the crucial artists and events that shaped Italian landscape photography in the early 1980s. Um, the seminal work uh, initiated in the 70s by Olivo Barbieri, Gabriele Basilico, Giovanni Chiaramonte, Vittore Fossati, Luigi Ghirri, and Guido Guidi, among others, catalyzed in 1984 in Viaggio in Italia, a uh, bad projection, anyway, uh, an exhibition and especially a publication that are now considered to be the point of departure for a new generation of photographers devoted to the exploration of everyday, banal, and marginal landscapes. Indeed, exploration was a key term in, a term in the critical vocabulary of the time. Viaggio in Italia, the book, included a short story by Italian writer Gianni Celati, titled Toward uh, the Delta, a reportage written while walking in the countryside and through the small villages along the Po River. In his introduction, critic uh, and historian Arturo Carlo Quintavalle spoke of a book, quote, perfectly built according to the model of a mnemonic and physical space, end quote. Mnemonic here stands for subjective and experiential. The photographic journey to Italy of the 1980s was an attempt to condense the personal geographies of 20 photographers into a book that could function as a memory trigger, much like the mental maps discussed by Frances Yates in her famous book, The Art of Memory. It was consistent with this approach that practically all the 10 sections of the book were dedicated to spatial issues. I'm giving you my rough translations here. Um, these titles often carry with themselves a, a game of words. Uh, as far as the eye can see, seafront, margins, uh, of place, capital P, uh, last stop, city center, on the threshold, nobody in particular, uh, closing at sunset, urban parks, Jotos O, 
Two years after Viaggio in Italia, Ghirri co-curated a project entitled uh, Explorations Along the Via Emilia, Views in the Landscape, involving 12 international photographers who documented the everyday landscape along the Roman way run, running from Milan to Rimini. In his introduction, uh, titled Photography and the Representation of the Outside, Giri developed a further critique of spatial images, speaking of the first photograph of the Earth taken from the space in 1969, and of his childhood experience with maps. He did, however, call into question a notion of time as he discussed new technologies flooding our daily lives with images at vertiginous speed and photography's power to create a space for meditation. Yet, um, he said, he wrote, it would be naive and even wrong to think of photography as the static image of our decay seen in an exasperated slow motion as a way to stop time, end quote. Photography, he continued, should rather be seen as an image of equilibrium or pacification between known and future representations. A number of similar collective projects were to follow in the 80s and 90s. Um, dozens of exhibitions and publications devoted to specific regions and landscapes helped define a generation of photographers who shared a common interest in the experience of place. A geographical agenda was at the core of another major project started in 1987 by Roberta Valtorta. Following the model of the Mission Photographique de la Datar, the archive of space involved 58 photographers, each one assigned with a specific area or subject, with the aim of creating an atlas or an inventory of architectural and environmental subjects situated within the administrative borders of the province of Milan. Again, it was an interesting topographical description at a specific historical phase, if not moment, that fueled uh, the archive. Although <clears throat> the project ran for a decade, as you can see here, from 87 to 97, and entailed seven different missions uh, the diachronic approach was never applied. What did change over time, however, according to Roberta Valtorta, was the focus of the survey, which turned from recognizable sites and monuments to the exploration of known places and uh, no man's land, marginal areas, fresh industrial, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> this lack of critical and theoretical interest in the temporal dimension of the landscape is uh, striking for a number of reasons. Italy had a long tradition of urban, regional, and geographical studies based on the very idea that a region, a region or a city should not be studied, studied as a point in space, but as a, I'm quoting, drama steeped in time, to quote from <clears throat> one of the fathers of Italian city planning, Giovanni Astengo. American landscape photography, which had a strong and lasting impact on, in Italy during this period, had made a similar point since at least the 1970s. One could probably cite many examples, but it is somehow paradoxical that the meditation on the historical condition of landscape offered by, for example, Robert Adams's The New West, uh, published in 74, or The New Topographics, uh, went totally unnoticed <clears throat> among Italian photographers. The same can be said for the result of the rephotographic survey project led by Mark Lett, as we have seen this morning, um, produced in the 70s, published in 1884. Even in the 90s, when the debate on um, Observatoire Photographique sur du Paysage took hold in France, the diachronic perspective remained practically absent from the work of Italian photographers and curators. Another striking aspect of this denial is the notion that, that the notion of time was a crucial element in the development of Italian conceptual and post-conceptual photography practiced by these very photographers when they began working in, at the, in the 1970s. Uh, well, I'm afraid I don't have the time to dwell on the work of Franco Vaccari, uh, who was Giri's friend, 
I will just mention briefly his idea of a new type of work of art that he dubbed uh, exposition in real time, sort of situ creating situations that would uh, produce uh, an unexpected forms of art uh, with the col active collaboration of the public. In this case, with the Venice Pinal of 1970 to the exploration, uh, the um, the exposition in real time number four. But let me move <coughs> on more rapidly to another example that was pretty influential um, for Giri's uh, education and most of the photographers of his generation. In the early 1970s, a post-conceptual approach to photography can be seen in Ugo Mules's uh, influential project called Verifica, Verifications. In particular, Verifica number three, photographic time dedicated to Yanis Kunelis. Uh, this piece presents a series of 36 photographs uh, taken from the same vantage point, documenting a performance staged by Kunelis in 1969, in which a musician, a piano player, played for several hours a modified version, sort of a hypnotic version of an aria from Verdi's Nabucco. Uh, so in his conceptual verification, Mulas meditated on the difference between uh, musical and photographic time. And um, in, 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 in the blurb of text that is part and parcel of the photographic work called Verifica, he writes, I'm quoting, time acquires an abstract dimension. In photography, it does not flow naturally, as in cinema or literature. This immobility is more powerful than any factual movement. It is the obsession of the repeated image that reveals the dimension of photographic time. Girri, who was e equally close to Vaccari and Mulas during the early years of his photographic, photographic education, took up their ideas and developed them into a series of projects that addressed the issue of photographic time in metaphorical ways. Time is, central, is a central aspect in Infinito, uh, a memorable work comprising 365 snapshots of the sky, one for each day of the year 1974, um, composed into a grid that can be read as a meta image of time comparable to Mullis's third verification that we have just seen. In both cases, we have a systematic series whose material form is determined by the objective conditions of, of its making. 36 frames for the photographic roll of film, 360 days of the year. For Girri, however, infinite proved, I'm quoting, photography's inability to fix the image of a natural fact. Uh, at the same time, in a in typical conceptual twist that characterized much of his thinking and writing, Geary suggested that it is precisely the camera's inability to represent natural phenomena that proves its partia partiality, its subjectivity, and thus uh, what he called the natural and independent character of photography's vision. Paradoxically, photography not as a technique, uh, but as a natural way of seeing. It should be acknowledged that these conceptual uh, ideas about the medium's uh, relation to time were difficult to adapt to the documentary style of documentary f of landscape photography, let's say, that, that Giri and his friend were developing in the 1980s. Positioning themselves against, as Marta said, the decisive moment, favoring a detached approach to the democratic forest of signs of the Western landscape, and privileging motionless scenes suspended in a ter temporal vacuum. These artists resorted to the classical language of 19th century photography and avoided as much as they could the actuality of the historical present. It has occasionally been noticed that uh, the politically charged landscape of the 70s and 80s is totally absent from Viaggio in Italia uh, as an antidote uh, uh, against the sectionalism, uh, the heated debates, the historical materialism prevailing in political science, uh, and the daily events of political violence uh, 
uh, occurring in the cities uh, during the 70s, these photographers proposed a pacified, existential, almost ecumenical gaze, gaze based on the idea of a collective us caught in a condition of historical suspension, out of time. The central perspective that structures most of Girri's photographs adds to this effect, creating an almost hypnotic relationship with the viewer, as you can see in this example from 1985. And yet we can detect some differences in the work of these artists. The peculiar presence of uh, people in Giri's photographs, for example, often provides a point of entry into an unexpected layer of time. Giri's characters are always gestureless, uh, often pro portrayed in a static or in un um, unexpressive uh, pose, or acting in the most ordinary and inconspicuous manner. And yet, like the characters in the films of Michelangelo Antonioni, for example, even minimal details in their attitudes uh, or expressions are sufficient to provide the hint of an action or a situation. In such instances, as we can see in this example, Kiri's photographs no longer to be, to, um, appear to be out of time, but rather suggest that a small action, a crypto event, is beginning or ending or that the friction between the geological time of the landscape and the vital existence of the human being is taking place. In his essays, Giri often mentioned similar issues, but I think that his notion of photographic time is best expressed in this passage in which he discussed the first emergence of a photographic conscience um, among the early 19th century primitives of photography. A mysterious silence seems to be the most clear and plausible way to structure a story from the inexhaustible matter of the external world. Thus, on one hand, we have the slow structure of the incomprehensible scene before us, through perspective, I would add. On the other, the discovery of everyday gestures, frozen for the first time, turns out to be equally incomprehensible in the magic of temporal suspension. Oscillating between moments of stillness and movement, photography op uh, opens itself to the city and to the entire world. Among the photographers associated to the group of Viaggio in Italia, the early work of Mario Cresci provides a slightly different approach to the issue of time. Born uh, near Genoa uh, and educated in Venice, Milan, and Rome, Cresci moved to the southern city of Matera in the 1960s starting a new career as a photographer, graphic designer, and social activist. His major book, Matera, 75, can be seen as a kind of historical and geographical atlas, comprising historical documentary photographs, transcriptions of uh, state laws on the preservation of the city, of the Sassi, um, um, maps, and a large series of his own photographs printed full page without any comment or caption. In Matera, following the Bauhaus-inspired uh, principle of the Institute of Industrial Design that he had attended in Venice uh, in the 1960s together with Guido Guidi, Cresci was interested mainly in using photography as a tool for creating com a comparative atlas of the archetypical structure of the human environment, uh, both in material and perhaps in social terms. Cresci's work in Matera shows a dialectic of anthropological structures that take on similar forms and materials sometimes, on one hand, the mineral, so to speak, stability of a pre-modern civilization carved, literally carved into stone. Uh, on the other, its inverted reflection in the instantaneous mirror of modern technology and capitalism. Banca Popolare del Materano. Occasionally, Cresci provides a paradoxical example of these long-term uh, temporal structures. In this case, for example, he wrote, 
I photographed some areas of the city from the same vantage point of some pictures taken in 1949. And I showed the two views side by side in order to underscore how things were transformed by time. As you can see, the transformative effect of time here can be counterintuitive. In much of Italy's south, in the mid up until the 70s and even 80s, change could be practically unnoticeable, as Pasolini then would talk about these things. Uh, I should mention that in the 70s, Cresci experimented on the issue of photographic time with a project that seemed to hark back to Mullis' verifications in the series titled Movements, made uh, significantly in Barbarano Romano, only 70 kilometers north of Rome, the, sea, the, the nation's capital, he staged individuals in their living environments against the backdrop of family photographs and memorabilia, uh, asking them to shake their head during the long exposure. In the resulting images, uh, uh, you can see a sociological record of material life in a changing civilization that carried within itself so a representation, a work of art that also both documentary, but also carries within itself a conceptual of metaphorical meditation on time. Uh, once again, Cresci wrote, we have a photograph within a photograph as a document within a document, an annihilation of time uh, whose fixity evokes the past. Um, Cresci's experimentation with long exposures also came from his studies at the advanced course um, uh, of industrial design, which Guido Guidi attended in the late 60s. Among landscape photographers of his generation, Guidi is probably the one who has worked more deeply and more constantly on the issue of time. So Marta has already given us a full account of the temporal structures that one can find, the different temporal structures that one can find in Guidi's work. Um, I have maybe some more information about the notion of the archives if we want to talk about this later. Here I should only mention that Guidi also began to treat the issue of time from a post-conceptual position in the late 1960s, creating pairs or diptychs, sometimes looking like fake uh, photographs, uh, fake stereographs that he would treat with sepia toning to simulate aging and inscribe them uh, as photographic documents with a caption and a date and a stamp uh, that he would immediately, immediately smear with, with his finger to, uh, to pretend that the photographic object uh, was, was old, had been you know, damaged by, by time and usage and so on. So he liked to create fake documents, uh, new photographs that at first sight might look like 19th century photographs in terms of materiality, in terms of uh, uh, their sepia tones, except that once you started to look at the information they carried, you could see um, a uh, TV set, uh, a person dressed in uh, modern um, fashion, and so on and so forth. Uh, this strategy of modification and erasure, as Marta already said, is evident in Guidi's photographs, included, uh, as I said, in, in the margins chapter of Viaggio in Italia, there is no chapter devoted to time. So, but in this chapter, you have at least three photographs by Guido taken in 1980, 19, already 1972, uh, that were about the notion of time, um, either the speed of a passing car, as we have seen, or on the right-hand side, a vernacular building corroded over the years by humidity and the weather. Time has the power to modify the state of things in unexpected ways and in a way the materiality of mod modified things uh, uh, reflects the alchemy of photography modified through the photographic process uh, um, going through light and, 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 uh, and acid, acids and materials. Now, these fragmented and almost metaphorical responses to the issue of time suggest, I believe, that a predominant character of Italian landscape photography of the 80s lies exactly in its refusal of chronological time. 
As I said, positing themselves outside the flow of dramatic events that ran through the decade and afterwards, uh, social conflict and political violence, the end of the welfare state, the industrialization and the collapse of the working class, uh, the Berlin Wall, the incipient globalization, these photographers developed a philosophy on the, of the landscape that juxtaposed the accidents of the quotidian to a transcending historicity. It was this pervasive historical condition of the Italian geography that mostly occupy the photographers who participated in Viaggio in Italia and, and the subsequent projects of this kind. Um, Kiri's remarks on a series he made uh, in 77, 78 called In Scala, devoted to a theme park near Rimini uh, Italia in miniatura, uh, featuring miniaturized versions of all the main monuments and sites of the country, from Piazza del Campo to St. Peter's in Rome. His remarks on this work can probably extended to the Italian landscape as such. Um, in in the, such a funny collage of monuments, Girri argues, we can see, he says, a representation of our historicity, an absolute unity that is non-spatial, non-temporal, but historical. Now, as Jacopo Benci has recently remarked in, a, in I think, an illuminating essay on Kiri's philosophical sources, similar ideas connecting the realm of playful observation uh, and historical consciousness can be found in a 1978 collection of essays by Italian philosopher Giorgio Agamben uh, in a book titled Infancy and History, in which he wrote, the essential character of the toy can be grasped only in the temporal dimension of a once upon a time and no more. The toy dismembering and distorting the past or miniaturizing the present, playing as much on diachrony as on synchrony, makes present and renders tangible human temporality in itself the pure differential margin between the once and the no longer. Miniaturization, photography one could say, in other words, is the cipher of history. Uh, in tune with these ideas, Benchi suggests Giri use photography, the art of miniaturization, to visualize the existential transience or temporality of the individual facing the absolute unity of the Italian historical landscape. In Italy, everything is history, ontologically history. And so for Giri and these photographers, it is as if they cannot find a way to treat this material in detail, in detail, and they can only accept it as such and to oppose to this ontological issue of historicity, the epiphany of their personal individual experience uh, using the camera that eventually can be hypothetically transferred onto, onto to a viewer looking at the photograph. Um, now, I wish to conclude, if I have a couple of minutes, my presentation by offering a totally different perspective on the works we have seen so far. While these photographs seem to address the notion of time in philosophical ways rather than by looking at the actual changes of the landscape, as we've seen this morning. And while these conceptual aspects are constantly being reinforced with the progressive canonization of these photographers as artists, one should only have a look at the recent retrospective that James Lingwood has dedicated to Luigi Ghirri. It's all about Ghirri's conceptual, metaphorical thinking, because documentary is something that we're not really interested in. So I believe that these um, extended collective explorations that we have seen carry within themselves a documentary potential that it is the task of the historian to unravel, restore, and communicate. As Carlo Arturo Quintavalle once suggested, the archive can be as much an art of memory as it can be an art of, obli of oblivion. So again, we can dwell this is another photograph by Guidi. We, we, can, we can dwell on the metaphorical value of this photograph depicting a nondescript war memorial in a rural village near 
with his hometown, Cesena, uh, around this little monument, the grass has been cut to form an arch that is echoed by the optical circle of the camera itself. A vernacular subject, a lieu de mémoire, and a timeless conceptual image of photography itself, all in one. And yet, for a moment, if we step back and consider this scene as a drama steeped in history, we can understand Guidi's view as a representation of a time landscape. In order to do so, we have to retrace it in its geography and its history. Research can help us restore the documentary value of these photographs by identifying the exact place and time in which they were taken. And a new diachronic perspective can be constructed ex post by comparing different visual and documentary sources on the same subject. Here I'm using very easily Google Street View, but um, we can use other types of visual and documentary sources as well. At the photographic level, this comparison helps us understand the ways in which the photographer has constructed a particular image out of the raw materials of the landscape, selecting certain elements and establishing new relationships among them. From the historical point of view, we can then chart the evolution of landscape over time, detecting the specific factors that account for its material and cultural transformation. Contrary to what we might expect, just as it happened with the re-photographic survey project in the US, nature can develop in regulated or entropic manners, uh, ending up to screen or conceal certain aspects of the visual environment. So this is again the same site in 1985 and in 2011. Thus, uh, changing our anthropological relation to lived space, the way we access it physically and mentally, uh, uh, we likes to make the example of uh, the archetypical uh, idea of a facade of a house that you can find in a child. Ask a child to draw a house and it will draw a face with two eyes and a mouth and so on. And this is what Guidi has been looking after for many years. Uh, this is how a house presents itself nowadays, not as a frontal face facade, but maybe you can spy into the private space of this uh, uh, situation, of the, of the private life of these people living here. And again, um, insp inconspicuous acts of uh, delimitation, of enclosure, bushes, uh, tree lines, markers, fences, gates, uh, suggest a process of progressive privatization of space, uh, which again obstructs the view as we walk in the landscape, as Guidi used to do, uh, making photographs that nowadays are probably no more available to our experience to sight. And this is why Google, the, the Google Street View car has a very high vantage point, uh, I guess. Um, and again, we, go, we could go on with further examples by either Guidi, um, again, who has often photographed the rural landscape around his home, or even, so again, privatization, uh, or um, we can map uh, a history of historical process whereby probably we already had here a gate that had been left to itself and to rust and ruin, which was later rebuilt uh, as a gate. The field is not necessarily uh, closed, but it's a symbolic marking of the entrance to the villa that we don't actually see at the end of this road, but it is the renovated house that we once, um, a rural house that has been renovated and transformed to uh, function, if not appear like a villa. Or even uh, Luigi Ghirri, we have already seen this photograph, uh, who has 
traveled perhaps more extensively across the country. And again, we can see the same um, ideas in place here. Curiously, even such a simple act of contextualization has never been attempted in Italy. While many of these photographs were made as part of documentary projects commissioned and paid, by, uh, paid for by uh, public institutions, in most cases we have no trace of the original prints delivered by the photographers and a general archive of these works has never been made. The publication made on such occasions are rather exhibition catalogs than historical instruments. Uh, they often present only a selection of the photographs that they were made or delivered. Uh, and generally, they are reproduced with minimal or imprecise or even wrong information about their place and date. Uh, all these observations, and I'm concluding, suggested a systematic mapping of all the, all the documentary projects, as I said, dozens of documentary projects developed in Italy in the 80s and 90s would allow us to start a new ex post Observatoire du Paysage and to return these photographs to the public domain where they belong. A digitized archive made available online or on an interactive platform, and we had examples this, this morning, we have this other example that uh, here of a old New York, uh, a digitized archive um, would allow these photographs to be experiment, experienced and appropriated by the present inhabitants of uh, these places, of the landscapes uh, depicted, depicted in these photographs. And at, at the same time, such an archive would be crucial for a better understanding of the subjects, themes, styles, visual languages, iconographic models, and intertextual references uh, of this generation of landscape photographers whose interactions and sort of crossbreeding has never been studied. It is precisely this connection between the two aspects, the temporal evolution of landscape and the cultural development of its observers that I believe we should reconstitute in order to understand the place we live in and to pay, pass it over to generations to come. Thank you. Thirty-five minutes. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. Merci, uh, Antonello. Uh, je vais vous poser une question en anglais, uh, en français. Uh, bon, J'ai pas téléchargé mon, mon logiciel en anglais pour parler en public. Hein. Uh, alors, a, merci pour votre exposé très riche. If you need some translation uh, about my question, uh, uh, j'aurais beaucoup de questions à vous poser, mais je vais vous poser une question uh, plutôt sur le, le début de votre intervention et euh, sur le, notamment le titre et l'expérience paysagère, euh, le titre des livres et, euh, que vous avez mentionné et les expériences paysagères qui sont euh, euh, visibles dans ces livres. Donc vous avez montré Viaggio in Italia, euh, vous avez montré Via Emilia Esploration euh, sous la Via Emilia. Il euh, y, y a également euh, Linea di Confine ou encore euh, Cette Gioni del Paysaggio Italiano qui est également sur la question de la route. Et, et euh, en même temps, vous avez parlé de la question de, euh, de l'archive. Il, il y a donc cette archive euh, Archivio dello Spazio. Euh, Marta a montré euh, et a rappelé à quel point le paysage italien s'était transformé euh, dans l'après-guerre. Et je voulais vous demander si, euh, finalement, les photographes italiens n'avaient pas eu la nécessité de, de réexplorer un territoire dont ils avaient oublié qu'il qu s'était radicalement transformé Et pourquoi ce, ce motif de la route Pourquoi cette exploration alors qu'ils sont a priori des habitants euh, euh, de l'Italie Alors pourquoi cette idée qu'il faut réexplorer et prendre la route en fait euh, et pas seulement habiter On n'est pas dans une configuration où on délimite un territoire, on va quadriller le territoire photographiquement, euh, on est dans un voyage personnel à travers un pays comme si on ne le reconnaissait plus ou on avait oublié qu'il qu était déjà transformé. Uh, um, um. I think it's hard to respond because I, I tend to see so many cultural factors playing um, at the same time. And also, uh, because of the work I do, um, I tend to see um, 
the specificity of each one of these photographers and to leave aside for a moment the, the idea or perhaps the myth that they are actually a coherent group of, or even a manifesto. So anthropologically and soci sociologically, I see many differences among their practices. Uh, so one could see uh, Gabriele Basilico being educated as a, an architect in Milan in, in the 1960s. And uh, he began to photograph under that's and this is the other aspect. I mean, what, what do they say and what can we say? Basilico said that he had been influenced by one would never expect it, probably Bill Brandt. So his first work was done in Glasgow with a sort of reportage in a sort of dark a Bill Brandt style. And it, and it was published in an architectural magazine as a capitalist interpretation of social conflict in a uh, worker's neighborhood in Glasgow. It was accompanied by a text, and this was the vocabulary and the approach. And then you know, he went on, possibly under the influence, as he says, of the, the Beckers and Louis Baltz, to make a atlas of uh, um, factories uh, in Milan in the second half of the 1970s. Uh, and I think it's very interesting that 78 is the year when um, Aldo Moro, the leader of the Democratic Party, was kidnapped by the Red Brigades and killed by the Red Brigades with a dramatic and a turning point in uh, Italian political and cultural history. And that's when Basilico, so the Red Brigades, uh, um, I mean, there was an incredible amount of de debate on the degree to which they had been supported by the working class inside uh, their factory in Milan. Uh, and, and I think it's extremely significant that uh, Basilico's work uh, is about the facades of these factories as if they were already abandoned, industrialized, as if they were not inhabited daily by workers and conflicts and so on. And, and on the opposite side, uh, we, we can talk of Guido, who was never very fond of traveling, I mean, on the road. I mean, he did it, uh, he, he photographed mostly based on the idea that you photograph what is within the reach of your experience. You don't go out to any kind of exotic place, even the south, uh, although he did go to Sardinia at some point. Um, so he photographed around where he lived on the way to Venice because he drove to Ven between Cesena and Venice every week back and forth. And uh, in the Venice area, not Venice because Venice is not photographable for him, but Marghera and all the urban spread uh, between uh, Porto Marghera and Padua. Uh, so in a way, he was looking for unconventional uh, subjects, and he found them where he happened to be. The whole idea of the viaggio in Italia, I think, uh, is uh, due to Ghirri. Uh, and in a way, um, in the texts he wrote, in the 1970s and 80s, he, um, he carries on this idea of uh, uh, the small travel uh, as a way to discover things. Uh, I mentioned this idea of the epiphany that you can experience with your camera in front of a situation, which is also one of Geary's ideas. And so if you multiply th that idea at the national scale, uh, you see how Mm, I think he even spent his weekends with fellow photographers exploring, let's go to Mantua. Let's, and as I was doing this work of uh, finding the actual place where he went, uh, for example, there's one photograph um, that was made, according to Google Maps, near a village called Guarda. Look. So uh, since in the 70s, he was so fascinated with this game of words, which is transferred into his titles, 
uh, palindromes, Italia, Ailati, and blah, 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 blah. Uh, I guess that he liked to travel to explore uh, new places, a genuine uh, interest in discovering a provincial Italy uh, in the steps of certain aspects of neorealism, uh, in the steps of, he said, Bob Dylan, Desolation Row, and so on, but also that he was looking very cleverly at places that could carry a sort of crypto conceptual value in themselves, in a way. Um, it is a different story for Cresci, who with such a political consciousness leaves the industrial north and moves to Matera, where there is nothing for photography, and he creates a set of conditions in, in which he can actually work as a photographer and as a graphic designer, earn his living, but also work as a social activist uh, with city planners and sociologists and so on. So um, I would not romanticize the idea of, uh, the, of photographing on the road of pure exploration, but I would map a set of different approaches to this idea that I think, think can be synthesized by the denial of the exotic, the denial of um, um, reportage. You don't photograph everyday uh, events, uh, the occupation of the factory, uh, the eviction, uh, and all the things that you can find in the news. You don't find things, you don't photograph things that you can find in advertisement. And so you photograph things that have no image in the common, uh, in the collective imagination, or you photograph things that are, have an image that is buried deep down in the collective imagination. For example, postcards. And this is also something that Walker was like to do. Uh, so besides these counter objectives, I think you can find then many ways uh, to approach the issue of uh, traveling. And, uh, just one more thing, you talk about the intimacy. And, and so this also reflects to the notion of, an, of intimacy. All these photographers nominally shared uh, an idea of detachment, uh, the death of the author and so on and so forth. But uh, yeah, it is true that stylistically or theoretically, each one of them expressed um, some ideas about a mediation between the uh, detachment of the camera and the epiphany of experience. So I don't know whether I would call it intimacy again, because intimacy is really about something something that, that uh, in a way I care about. That's why the way I read it, uh, because it is part of my uh, personal experience, subjectivity. Um, let's say most of the time it was an attempt to create photographically a, a sort of connection um, with the landscape and its time and to transfer this connection, this opening uh, to the viewer, then uh, I think it, it, it could be equally an intimate connection that was created, but also a very mental connect connection, and, and, and these two things went together all the time. I mean, it, it was never uh, a sentimental journey, I believe. <laughs>